Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles podcast that we call Things We Said Today. This is a show that we feature just about every single week with a brand new episode, and it's a Beatles news-themed show talking about what's going on news-wise in the Beatle world. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the co-hosts of the show, best known for my syndicated radio program on the Beatles called Every Little Thing, being joined by my co-host, Mr. Beatles Examiner himself, and that is Steve Marinucci. Hi, hi, Ken. Hi, everybody. Happy New Year. Yes, Happy New Year to you, Steve, and to all of our listeners. Uh, what I thought we'd talk about in our show this time is a subject that is so near and dear to Steve <laughs> that I'm bringing it up <laughs> once again. Once again. <laughs> and actually, I promise him this will be the last time in a very long that's, time that we even... You said the last time, but <laughs> all right. We'll, we'll, I'll, I'll hold you to that one. It concerns Magical Mystery Tour, the film, but um, actually what happened was back in December on PBS, there was a documentary that aired that uh, we haven't talked about here on the show yet called Magical Mystery Tour Revisited. This was about uh, 50 minutes long, I would say, mm-hmm. in my area. It aired on December the 14th, and... Um, I really enjoyed it, but I want to get your take on it, and we'll tackle a few subjects about this documentary. But first of all, Steve, I want to get your overall impression of this special. Well, I could be really cynical and say this was better than Magical Mystery Tour, but... You're not going to say that. (laughs) But I think this should have been on the DVD. I really wish they had held out, because I'm sure they knew this was coming down the pike when when they put the DVD together, right? You know, I, I, they must have. Hmm. But I really wish this had been on the DVD rather than the make the little short making of that they had, um, because it was so much better than that. It really put the the whole film in much better perspective, uh, put Magical Mystery Tour in much better perspective than did the making of, which was just a straight, you know, this is why we did this type of thing. And hmm. um, I, I, I thought the... Uh, the the BBC thing was just so much more um, encompassed so much more information and really put uh, a lot more uh, information you know especially from uh, for Americans who I mean I don't think Americans knew or know what really Boxing Day is all about and that was really part of this Magical Mystery Tour revisited to kind of it gives you kind of an explanation of what Boxing Day really is and what kind of atmosphere film was first seen in hmm. um and i so i i thought i i really liked it I, I you know i thought it was fantastic i really did that's one of my favorite parts about the whole documentary is that it shows you what it was like in england at that time when it aired and that it was in black and white and it even tells you that it followed a patula clark christmas special mm-hmm. you know it really sets the tone for what it was like in england at that time there were even some original air checks in there. Uh, they really, BBC d- really dug into the archives for that, and it was just, it was really, it was really fun to watch. Uh, it, it really was, and I like that that historical perspective um, hmm. that wasn't in the the making of uh, as much. I mean, it, as they mentioned Boxing Day, and Boxing Day has always been mentioned every time you know we talk about Magical Mystery Tour and. You know when it originally aired, but nobody, uh, Americans especially, don't really know what that's all about, and that's what the film did very nicely is to to tell you what that was. Yeah. Well, I think one of the best things about this documentary is, and and the sign of a good documentary is one that can appeal to every level of fan, and in this case, uh, a casual fan can learn a lot about the about the film Magical Mystery Tour, and even a hardcore fan can learn a few things. Mm-hmm. So that's what I appreciated a lot, one of the things about this documentary. But um, was there anything in particular that you learned about Magical Mystery Tour, the film, that you never knew before? Well, one of the, one of the interesting things, and I, I, I don't recall whether Ringel said this in the, in the smaller film or not, was that they went through books to get to look for actors. I thought that was kind of amusing. Right. Uh, you know, they... It, it actually uh, sitting here watching because I was just watching it before we got on the phone here. I hate to get political, but I was I was I recalled the the binders full of women comment from the election, <laughs> <laughs> and and 
you know, I don't know why I did, but I don't know why that why why that hit my head, but it 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 kind of did, you know, that they were that they were, you know, scouting for people going, you know, going through books and everything trying to find actors. I thought that was just really wonderful and the fact that they got they apparently knew uh, Ivor Cutler from before. Hmm. And they also knew Nat Jackley, but some of the other people you know, uh, Jesse Robbins obviously came came from those little, you know, running through the books trying to pick up unknown people, and then they they had some fans on there too. Although the fans really didn't play much of a role, they were there. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of that was kind of interesting. And the fans and there were some of the fans some of the secretaries are in the film talking about what it was like to be there. Yeah, there were fan club secretaries who mm-hmm. were in, who were in the film. Yeah, Frida Kelly was one of them. She was there, although. She didn't really talk about it. She's. I don't recall. I think they show a clip of her. There's a clip of her in the film, in the in the actual in in the in Magical Mystery Tour, and but she's not interviewed in the in the documentary. There are other other fans that are interviewed, however. Hmm. Yeah. I'll tell you from my perspective, a few things that I learned. Uh, one concerned Paul, and the other with Ringo and it had to do with camera work that Paul was experimenting with eight millimeter film mm-hmm. at the time. And you can see how that affected the fool on the hill sequence. Right. And in addition to that, especially what Ringo had to say that he was playing around with prism lenses. Right. And During, for, uh, Blue uh, Jay way. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I thought that was fascinating. You know, I never knew that, that before. I, I, I thought f- that was, I thought that was fascinating that he said that. And, uh, it's interesting that he hasn't he hasn't done more of that, you know. All these little, all these things about Ringo that it seems like he's he's never really fully explored. You kind of wonder why, you know. But well, all these years I've heard that he's a real shutterbug, right? You know, going back to a hard day's night, you'd see him in the in the scene there when he's playing hooky, you know, and mm-hmm. uh, you see him with the camera. And I've heard all these years he loves to take pictures, but you never see that side of him. Well, there was a story that came out uh, a year or two ago that he that he had lost a lot of the pictures he had taken, mm. which would oh, I mean that was just tragic to hear that. Right. He said in between the moves, I guess, and you know when he's moved, a lot of them have disappeared, which is really sad. Yeah. Well, he's still got to have quite a bit, I would hope. I would. If, he, if he's would taken hope. a lot through the years. Yeah. Well, at least he had the letters that he put out in the. Uh, in the book a couple of years ago, but, uh, you know, yeah, it, just to imagine what he might have had is, you know, so well. One of the um, the highlights for me in, in uh, this documentary are the interviews. Mm-hmm. And you not only have Paul and Ringo, you do have archival clips from John and George. Uh, but some of the people, just in case there are folks listening right now who haven't seen this documentary yet, people who are interviewed in this, in this uh, film... They include Martin Scorsese, uh, Peter Fonda's in there, Paul Gambaccini, the journalist, is in there, right. Paul um, Merton, a comedian and broadcaster, Terry Gilliam is in there, Neil Innes, uh, of course, being in the uh, Bonzo, the Bonzo Dog, Dog Band, yeah. yeah. And right. um, so you had all those people. Barry Miles is in there, who uh, a lot of people know because he authored the Many Years From Now book. Right. The uh, biography on on Paul McCartney. So I really got a kick out of all these different interviews and everybody's own perspective. And one of the things that I happen to really enjoy is that even though there seems to be this undertone of trying to give this film a lot more credit, they also do point out the good and the bad and the criticism that exactly. was received yeah, I was gonna, at that I time. Yeah, I was going to mention that too. That that no, even McCartney, who you know, anytime there's a something like this. I mean, he usually goes, you know, all out to praise things. Even he is is a little. I'm not not a lot critical, but there is some. You know, he he does say that. You know, he he knows that older older uh, viewers, you know, probably didn't like it, and he he acknowledges that. One of the other things too is the fact that um, watching uh, between the two of them talking about it, whereas McCartney is. Is a little more businesslike. Ringo is so warm. His memories of that are so warm. And actually, I, I kind of didn't in the in the making of documentary. You don't get that as much as you do here because there's more material here. But 
um, I noticed that that was interesting too. That Ringo had fond memories of of doing this, and he also appreciated the fact that they had the freedom to do what they wanted to do then, right? Whether it was good or bad. Mm-hmm. And uh, he also showed the diagram, well, of the circle <laughs> that Paul presented. Like, this was the whole idea. Mm-hmm. You know, this was, there was no script. It was all improvised. But when I, when I think about it, it's kind of like, you know, having been in radio all these years, looking at a programming clock, and all of a sudden at a line at uh, 10 minutes after, you've got, here it is, Fool on the Hill video. You know, and at uh, 40 after, it's the dream sequence. So it gradually got filled in. And that's how they built around it, from a circle. Right. But they also kind of played as they went along. I mean, they kind of threw things out and, and uh, as they went along. Right. One of the other things about the, about the film is the, we're tempted again with the pristine music video clips. Mm, that's right. Um, like Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields. I mean, watching uh, All You Need Is Love, which looks great, and Hello Goodbye, they all look so fantastic. And, and it, you know, you kind of sit and watch those things and you go, why don't we have a video, a release of, uh, of all the videos, so, you know, music videos, why? I'm sure that's what you were thinking, because that's your number one wish. Yes, yes. Well, um, I, I, uh, yeah. I do think it's probably down the pike. I hope so. Cross, I'm crossing, crossing my uh, fingers on that one. Mm, what's the point of continuously teasing fans with this stuff? And, of course, all the, you know, the, the loyal, hardcore fans of the years already have it on bootleg. Mm-hmm. They've collected all this stuff. But um, I do appreciate the fact that this wasn't just some kind of pure whitewash and saying that this was, you know, a masterpiece. And at the very end of the film, in fact, Paul was kind of saying that, you know, he, he was pretty much saying that it may not be like the greatest film of all time, but it may have been somewhat groundbreaking in the fact that it allowed for experimentation and more freedom and maybe that affected future films. Mm-hmm. You never know. There could be a lot of independent filmmakers who were influenced by it. And that also brings up the point about Martin Scorsese, who really praises this film right. in a lot of ways. And you got to at least uh, appreciate the fact that this is Martin Scorsese talking, someone who's such a well-respected director. And one of the things that I found really interesting, in fact, I wrote it down, he said that this is something that has uh, stayed with him in a lot of his work, that he really found it interesting, um, the freedom of the camera during the beginning of the film when Magical Mystery Tour plays and they're in the bus, and the restraint of the character's as far as not looking towards the lens, that was something that kind of stuck with him all right. these years. And he says that that influenced a lot of his work. So you have no idea, even though there are a lot of people who will think, oh, this was a big disaster from the Beatles. Who knows how it affected other people, whether it's fans or whether it's artistic people. So, um, you know, I found that really interesting. How did you feel about Paul Gambaccini's comments? In the documentary, he had said, and I'm sure that this is subject for debate, although a lot of people will agree with him, that 1967 was arguably their most creative year. But when you think about it, it really was a tremendous year. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't necessarily believe what, uh, what he's saying, um, because I think he, he tends to try and soap... Um, what he has, you know, what he has to do. Um, so I, I, I kind of have to, I don't take him, you know, take what he's saying and, and believe it. I, I kind of have to, you know, listen to it. And, and um, He's basically making the point that since the Beatles had three singles that year that all went number one, and they had Sgt. Pepper, at the end of the year they combined the singles with the songs from Magical Mystery Tour, so they really had, you know, two full albums of really great material that mm-hmm. could be looked at as their most creative period, 1967. Even though Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane were recorded in November and December of 66. Well, I mean, I, I you know, I don't, I, I don't think that particular film was all that great as far as, you know, the music anyway. So, you know, I don't think that it um, it was all that it was all that fantastic. It really wasn't. Mm-hmm. So, Has there ever been anything at all that where your opinions have changed through the years about certain things artistically, whether it's music or films? 
you, are you talking about the Beatles, or are you talking about in general? In general. Or do your opinions tend to stay the same through the years? That's a, that's a tough question. Um, I'd, have to, I'd have to really think about that. Well, I don't know. I mean, I think probably the, my opinion, for example, of the Beach Boys, some of the Beach Boys stuff has changed. For better or worse? <laughs> probably better. I don't think I, I don't. I, well, for example, I don't think I like Pet Sounds as much when it came out as I do now. Okay. And I mean, I saw Brian Wilson do that, so um, I think probably that that's one of the things. I don't think I, I don't think I liked it as much as I do now. The fact that I you saw Brian, you, the fact that you saw Brian in concert do it really helped you to appreciate it more. Yeah, I think so. I also happen to I also happen to meet Brian. <laughs> so I don't know if that's if that's really fair or not, but but yeah, I mean that that may have had you know that may have been something something about it too. And I, I, my mind has changed about McCartney stuff too, you know, over the years, and and some of Ringo's stuff. I think I like Ringo's stuff. I appreciate more of Ringo's stuff now, more uh, about Ringo's stuff now than I did originally. I don't think I liked uh, some of the some of the. Um, solo albums as much as I do now. I think I enjoy them now. And I think also his my opinion of his t- touring has, has also gotten a lot better. I think looking back at some of those those old concerts, um he, I mean he was just really he, he was much better than than I than I originally thought. And even now, the, what he has now, for example, the last tour is even is a great example of that. Um it was much better. He's his his tours have always been much better together than they are individually. In other words, if you take the, some of the, the individual names and put them out there, I think the tours are are better. And I think Ringo obviously has a lot to do with that. But okay, but it's see, it's a natural thing. Whether you're judging music, paintings, films, any kind of art, where your opinions can change through the years, right. it can go in a in a positive direction or a negative direction. It's it's a natural thing. And with me, Magical Mystery Tour, I'm not going to say it's the greatest film ever, but I, I like it more now, learning more about it. And I think visually, it's very interesting. Especially now, I, I, you, you uh, learn all this stuff about the camera work mm-hmm. uh, from for uh, Fool on the Hill and, and Blue Jay Wade, and, and I really enjoy watching it more now, just knowing that. But obviously, this was an experimental film. There was no script. It was all spontaneous. And so it has a whole different feel to it than A Hard Day's Night and Help did. And yeah. like I've said before, I just appreciate the fact that it's something that was different. The Beatles did not want to repeat themselves, and that's one of the things that I really admired about them. They were not a real formula-type act in any way. So Magical Mystery Tour was a big detour from doing the, the two previous films, and there may be some people now, today, who will watch it and probably like that more than a hard day's night or help, and there's nothing wrong with that. I, I would that would be very hard to imagine because I think, you know, for what it is, it's um, I think the the Beatlemania aspect of of a hard day's night and help um, are something that at least in America people really enjoy that type of thing. I mean the the whole Beatlemania thing um, for those you know for anybody that was around back in 64 and remembers how that was at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, a Hard Day's Night, for example, really brings that back into perspective and, and really is a big reminder of that whole thing, even though it's not exactly the way things were. Yeah, but so, I'm just saying everybody has different tastes, and it is possible to like different types of films. No, it's true. And, Some and, people might like Let It Be more than watching those first two Beatles movies. Actually, and actually, I think Let It Be, in many respects, is better than Magic Mystery Tour. Not because of the the fighting, and not because of the the tension and everything, but because you know they're in the studio and they're you know and they're busy you know they're in, they're busy playing, and you get to see them you know as they were. Right. And that's one of the one of the great things about Magic Mystery Tour, and hopefully we will get to see that again soon. And I. I'm pretty confident that we will. Okay, but I happen to feel that it's kind of unfair to even make a comparison when they're two different types of films, two different they approaches. Are, no, there, there, there's no question that there's, they're two, exactly two 
different types of films. It's like saying, what's better, A Hard Day's Night or Yellow Submarine? It's two completely different types of films. So same thing with Magical Mystery Tour. Some people might like the weirdness of Magical Mystery Tour. They might like the dream sequence with John shoveling the spaghetti. <laughs> or, and in, or, or, or fact, I am the walrus, you know? And in fact, the revisited documentary makes that point, that there were people who very much liked that particular scene that you mentioned of, of, with the spaghetti. Mm. Um, and, I mean, how could, you, how could you miss that? You couldn't miss it. Even, I remember when I got the album and opened, I mean, you couldn't miss... John Lennon with you know with the fork in his with the with the fork you know in the scene of of uh, of Jesse sitting there right you know, Aunt Jesse sitting there I mean there that was that said a lot that picture said a lot even before you saw the movie so but it was a it was one of the better scenes in the film that's for sure uh huh and then you've always got to ask yourself the question and this applies to just about anything the Beatles have done. Do you like it because it's the Beatles or because it's good? I mean, that's, no, that's a that, that's a good question, especially with this. And my and my feeling, honestly, is that a lot of people liked it because it was the Beatles. Had it not been the Beatles, I think there would have been a lot of people just that would have ignored it. Yeah, but you you still can enjoy it because it's the Beatles too. I mean, let's face it: the Beatles are fascinating to watch doing anything. Any interaction with any of the members oh, is, is interesting to Ab watch. Absolutely. So just on that basis alone, to watch anything at all can be interesting. Would Well, I mean, that, that opens up a great question. How would this film have gone over if it hadn't been the Beatles, if it had been somebody else? And I don't I think know. The question, I think the question is it wouldn't have gone over very well. You're I probably really, right really about do. that, but that doesn't mean that it's necessarily bad doesn't mean that it's a bad film. I still find it very interesting. To, well, you know, it's how do you separate yourself from the fan? <laughs> well, remember, too, that, and, and to say that, you also have to say that it wouldn't have had the music. You know, I mean, because obviously part of, a big part of Magic Mystery Tour is the fact that it had music in it, and it had, you know, all the new songs in it, that uh, I Am the Walrus and, you know, and things like that that they hadn't seen before. Right. When Paul has defended this film, he said, it's the only place you can see us doing on the Walrus. Right. And uh, so, I mean, there's, there, are some, there are some great things about the film that you can't you know, dismiss. Um, but you also have no way of knowing how a film like this can affect future generations of filmmakers just by no. watching this. No, I, and, and to that end, I, I really think I have to say that I think Martin Scorsese's comment about, you know, it had a huge effect. I think he he's overstating it just a little. I think he's overemphasizing the importance of it just just a little bit. I, I, well, why would he do that? Because he's being interviewed for it. It's not a comment. He's he's making it for the documentary, not for. It's not something he said outside of the documentary. If he had said this in an interview, you know, years and years ago or something, I'd. I believe it. I'd ha I have trouble. Uh, I think he was being over a little over dramatic on the. I don't the know. Importance. I don't think he he overdid it. He's just pointing out what he likes about the film, mm. and maybe there never was a reason for him to bring it up in the past before. That's possible. I just uh, it it just sounds like he's overselling the point just a little bit. I guess what I'm saying is I don't think in the in the big scheme of things that Magical Mystery Tour, even with this documentary, which I think does a, 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 a whole lot to, to raise the perspective and to raise everybody's ideas on, on what the film is. I don't think it, it still sells the film to where you know, uh, anybody would really want it to sell. In other words, it's not going to raise it to the level of A Hard Day's Night, ever. It's never going to be there. Well, you can never say never when it comes to art. Well, that's true, but I, I really don't think... I think in this particular case, it's pretty easy to say no. To it may be hard to imagine that, but who knows how the future will, future no, generations true. will look I mean, at a film like this. You know, come to think of it, we don't know what what it's going what's going to happen in years down the road. I mean, I mean the fact that we are talking about it this much today, and we have not talked about it, 
you know, it has not been talked about much at all since 66 is... 67. Or 67 is, is a, you know, is an advance, you know, is, is something positive. Or you could say that it's been overlooked all these years. It has been. It has been overlooked a lot because a lot of... I think, I mean, if nothing else, bringing the film back this year, you know, was the first time a lot of people... And I'm ta- not talking about young people. I'm talking about older people had seen it. You know, I mean, they even said it in the film, in the in the documentary, mm. that a lot of people didn't see it at the time. I remember, I mean, the first time I saw it was in at a um, a midnight screening, you know, at a theater that did weekly screenings locally. Mm. And they, they had... Uh, I remember it was a lousy copy. It wasn't a good copy. And we were sitting there watching it going, what the heck is this? You know, now that we get to see it for real, you know, with, you know, in an excellent quality, video, you know, film, it's it's nice that we finally get to, getting to see it the way it should be seen. Right. Um, and if nothing else, that's, that's excellent. I mean, that's fantastic that we finally got to see it for what it is. Mm-hmm. And also one other thing here is mm-hmm. something that Neil Innes said. He said that uh, Magical Mystery Tour was made like an art film. You wasn't supposed to know where the bus was going. So if you take his own assessment of the film, that it should be viewed that way. And kind of like what I said, you can't compare Yellow Submarine to A Hard Day's Night. It's a different kind of film. So judging it from that perspective as an art film... You may think more highly of it that way. True. I, I'm not going to argue about it, not, it being an art film. Definitely, it's an art film. Mm-hmm. It's very definitely an art film. The question is, did the art work? And I, that's obviously a judgment that everybody has to make on their own. Right. So. But I definitely would advise people to watch this, and I agree completely with Steve that it should have been one of the bonus tracks from the Magical Mystery to our box set. Although I do like all the bonus features that were on there anyway. Yeah, and hopefully, I mean, it's very possible that at some point it could get put out. I mean, the BBC has been known to to put things out before, and maybe, who knows, maybe at some point it will get put out. It should, so that people and can And this have... was part of uh, BBC Great Performances? What was the yeah, series? It was, it, 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 well, it was this time. Yeah, that's what they showed it with this time. But yeah, I, I mean, just the fact that it's the Beatles, the Beatles could put it out, you know, make a do a license thing with with um, with PBS, because there are other things that have been shown on PBS before that have been licensed and put out. So okay, well, I definitely think they should put this out. Yeah, oh yes, absolutely, I really do. Okay, so. I just want to take this time, since this is the end of the show, to thank everybody at fab4radio.com for carrying the show and for all of our listeners who listen on a regular basis. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, fab4radio.com. Thank you, everybody listening. And uh, we encourage all of you to write to us at our email address, things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. And Steve is the one who came up with that real long name that you have to type. Uh oh. And if you. My fault. If you can, please make some suggestions as to what you'd like us to do in future shows. Obviously, our show is focused on what's going on in the news, so it is kind of limiting in that perspective, but there's a lot of things going on on a day-by-day basis, and nobody knows that better than Steve here. So, um, by all means, please write to us and uh, let us know what you think of the show and any ideas you might have for us. Yeah, we'd love to hear from you. We We really, really would. And we also have our own Facebook page, which is the name of the show, Things We Said Today. Steve has his own Facebook page with his own name on it. With my name on it. And, and I, have, uh, I have Facebook pages for all my columns. Right. So. And I have my own website, which is KenMichaelsRadio.com, which features interviews and Beatles trivia every single week and great prizes to go along with it. So any number of ways you can get in contact with us, and we greatly appreciate it. Yep, I, 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 I'm not going to argue with you on that one. <laughs> yeah, please do. We want to hear from you. So thanks so much for listening. I'm Ken Michaels, joined by Steve Marinucci, saying we'll see you next time. See you next time.